Hello and welcome to the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Smolski, joined as always by my co-host Scott Pianowski. Uh, Wednesday afternoon, we've got day baseball. The sun is shining, Scott. It's a it's a beautiful time. It's a beautiful time. Yeah, assuming you didn't lose Wilson Contreras in the last 24 hours. But um that was, that was yeah, the weather, the weather's great. Um look, there hasn't been a lot of offense in baseball through five or six weeks, and mm-hmm. a lot of times that's something we tie to the weather. Not that I think April was a horrible weather month, but let's mm-hmm. hope warmer weather is coming. Balls get traveled a little bit more and some of those offenses we have that you know you're hitting 235 you know you it feels like every day you're starting with a four for 31 or something like that let's hope the bigger numbers are coming yes fingers crossed for that obviously they're uh the chances of them coming for the cardinals were dinged a Mm. little bit um with the wilson Contreras injury uh we'll get into that just a little note that for today what scott and i are going to do is kind of take a pulse um on how things are going so far this season we're going to obviously do the news and notes um we're going to look at some of our bold predictions from our our prediction show in the preseason and just look at some of the things that you know scott and i maybe got right or wrong and and how we're kind of adjusting to that and then at the end we're going to take a look at just some of the pitching the team stats like the pitching stats and the offenses and look at if we have a better sense now of of what teams to target um you know both with our pitchers and what teams to target um you know with our hitters when we're you know they have a three-game stretch against so and so um as always you know, if you can rate and review this podcast uh, wherever you're listening, that's super helpful for us. It does actually make a difference in getting people to kind of like listen and getting it out there. So that's very helpful to to all of us here if you're willing to do that. Um, we'll jump we'll jump into the Wilson Contreras injury. Uh, we're not going to partake too much in the discussion of who's to blame. Um, I really don't necessarily like that that discourse has taken over Twitter because we've got a guy in the midst of a really good season with a fractured forearm and like trying to associate blame to that is I think just taking away from the fact that it it sucks. It's unfortunate. Um, I think, you know, blame can be passed around. JD Martinez was behind the batter's box. Do hitters do that all the time? Yes. Uh, What's the point of the batter's box? If the ump isn't going to make the hitter stand in the batter's box, was Wilson Contreras too close to try to frame low pitches? Probably um it it's just the nature of the game and it's unfortunate that it happened um we're looking at a six to eight week time frame right now is what the cardinals have said um you know scott and i have always mentioned you know we'll take the high end on that um you know in addition to all the hitting it's obviously his catching hand um so he just has to make sure that that is um, fully healthy and ready to withstand, you know, the beating of catching 95 plus mile an hour fastballs all game long. I think you're looking at at least two months without Contreras, uh, probably back in like sometime in the middle of July. Um, if you can stash him, go for it. Um, you know, catcher is not a great landscape, but two months is a long time to take, you know, like in an NFBC format, two months is a long time to either take a zero or have a catcher on your bench. Um, and I, I just think it depends on how beat up you are in other spots. Yeah, you know, my, my take here is that as far as replacing Contreras is that if you're in a one-catcher league, you're going to be okay. If you're in a two-catcher league, you're probably screwed. You're going to really have to dig deep and just hope to get you. Yeah, I, I had Contreras and NL Tout. I'm dreading going over that waiver wire and seeing what I can get. And you know, nobody wants to trade any good offensive players, so the trade market is going to be available to me. I might I might push back a little bit on the, the July comeback. I, I think maybe it might be August before we see him again. The other thing, the other wrench in this is that the Cardinals are off to such a poor start. Mm-hmm. They came in last last year. I think they might be really close to hitting the button and blowing this thing up. And this team, I think they're I thought they were in contention to be the worst team in this division. And I know it's a division where there might not be a lot of separation between first place and last place. There isn't a juggernaut team here. Although if things mm-hmm. went if the Cubs got a couple of breaks, we know they got Cody Bellinger back this week, and Suzuki may not be that far behind. We're going to talk about them in a little bit. Imanaga has been so good. He was good again in a no decision last night. Maybe the Cubs have the potential to run away a little bit from this division. I don't think anybody thinks Milwaukee's as good as they played so far. Pittsburgh is still a team. We feel like they're kind of on the come. Maybe they're a year or two away. All that said, when trading season starts in the middle of the year, I have to believe the Cardinals are going to be sellers and maybe it Contreras is a proud player. He wants to earn his money. He wants, you know, players want to play. I get that. Sure. 
But I just wonder if there may not be as much urgency to get him back if, if the team is like 15 games out in July. I can see that. that's a really that's a really important point to bring up that you know nobody's saying they're shutting him down but what you know the implication that it might extend his time like a, a couple weeks um, is not necessarily I think that's certainly within bounds. Um, if you are looking to move on from Wilson Contreras, I'll give you a couple catchers that are rostered in under thirty percent of um, Yahoo leagues. Uh, obviously, it might depend on you know your league type. There are some guys who are really dropping down the rankings uh, or the roster ship rates like Kybert Ruiz and Gabriel Moreno and Alejandro Kirk, who were guys that, you know, people were in on at the start of the year, their names to keep in mind. They're not listed here for me because they're not actually performing well of late. So I'm not saying run out and get them, but they're available. And I, I think you need to, you know, keep an eye on that. I would say the biggest uh, name over the past couple of weeks has been Danny Jansen, um, who's come back from his own injury. We know Jansen has always hit when he's been healthy. Um, since coming off the IL over the last two weeks, he's hitting 385 with three home runs, four RBIs, and seven runs. He's DHing when he's not catching because the Blue Jays lineup is a little bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in the short term, I kind of feel like that's where I'm gravitating, understanding that with Jansen, that may only be three weeks or a month before I look for something else again, but I kind of think that's how you have to approach catcher if you lost somebody like Wilson Contreras. Yeah, I, I love the call, and you hit on the key point. He's getting playing time even when he's not behind the plate, so you get that volume. You get those extra at-bats in a Toronto lineup that, that maybe it's closer to league average. I hate to say that because I, I always want to believe this is a top five, top ten offense that hasn't performed like that. But I do like the Jansen call, and you you use the 30% cutoff, which I think is perfectly reasonable. If you're in a little bit of a shallower league, a player who's a little bit like Jansen, although he hasn't performed that well, Mitch Garver is in Seattle starting to finally hit. His season mm -hmm. numbers don't look good yet, but it's because he got off to such a horrible start. He's another guy who, when he's not catching, he's DHing. He's basically a DH primarily for them anyway. We, we know they have rally at the catcher spot. Yeah. I still think Mitch Garver is going to be a viable fantasy player. And, and also just remember, too, when guys get off to horrible starts, they can start to turn it around and it doesn't show up in the stats. We spent a lot of time preseason talking up Zach Neto, and then he had like two hits in the first three weeks. I mean, he did absolutely yeah. nothing. You look in the last two weeks, Zach Neto is OPS over a thousand. He's up to five steals. He's got three home runs. Eventually the angels, I think are going to move him up in the lineup. Unfortunately, he doesn't play catchers. So he doesn't fit this segment, but just make sure you're not tripped up by, Oh, but I want Zach Neto. He's in two thirty. He stinks, you know. Well, he's right. starting to figure it out, and I think he's in a situation where he's going to percolate up in that lineup. The Mariners haven't given up on Garver, so I think he's an interesting add. But of the under thirty percent crowd, I thought Jansen stuck out as the clear go get guy. Yeah, Jansen and, and Connor Wong. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the Red Sox are are always going to kind of mix and match. I mean, you know, they're they are going to play Reese McGuire as a left handed bat. Um, but Connor Wong over the last two weeks is hitting 393 with two home runs, six RBIs, uh, four total runs. The batted ball quality is really good. Um, I don't know that he's going to keep hitting this well, but again, you know, solid lineup, consistent playing time, not as much playing time as Jansen. Um, he's a name that I would watch. Uh, obviously, Ivan Herrera, who's set to just be the starting catcher in St. Louis without Contreras, is a name to watch. Um, he was getting a lot of um, catching opportunities earlier in the year when the when the Cardinals were banged up and they were DHing Contreras because you know Herrera made some swing changes in the offseason and, and looks pretty good um and so I understand that like we're looking at small sample sizes but you know he's gonna get a decent run of playing time over the next two months or whatever um if you have Contreras at an IL spot like that's a really easy swap because you just know you'll have a catcher until Contreras is, is back. And as we tape this, Herrera is actually going to back clean up on Wednesday, which which is yeah. a, a little bit of a statement on where the Cardinals are at right now. Yes, it but is. it also yes, shows it. that they believe in him if they're yeah. immediately plugging him into that. And this isn't like the old Jim Leland thing where it's like, oh, Larry Walker can't play today. Let's have Lenny Harris bat third. Right. This is more like, no, we, we think Herrera is actually a pretty good player. Um, another catcher hitting cleanup. I'll just mention two guys really quickly um, who I covered. I wrote an article on NBC Sports, which you can find called uh, Fantasy Baseball Hitter Trade Targets for May. And I created like a stat leaderboard of guys who uh, were running really strong barrel rates um, 
had good max exit velocity, had good swinging strike rates, and were making a lot of contact overall. And just looked at like, okay, who are hitters that are making good decisions at the plate, hitting the ball hard and not swinging and missing a lot? Generally speaking, that should work for you. Tyler Stevenson popped on that. Um, he's kidding cleanup most of the time for the Reds. Uh, the the surface level stats aren't there, but he has a 20% barrel rate. Um, and his exit velocity on fly balls and line drives was 95 miles an hour. Um, he's chasing less and has a 92% zone contact. I think he's being like a little bit too passive, but like he was a prospect of some note. We he was always like kind of an offense first catcher, and he has injury problems of his own. It hasn't panned out, but he's hitting the ball really well. And then Austin Wells with the Yankees has been incredibly unlucky so far. Um he had like a he has a 190 batting average, but an over 230 XBA. He's got an over 13 percent barrel rate. Um, he's you know not swinging and missing a lot. I, this isn't like a I think Stevenson is a higher upside play, but I think Austin Wells is somebody who will begin to produce and in that lineup, um, that could be interesting. And then two guys who are just playing right now and playing well are Ben Rortvet, who's taken over the starting catcher job for the Rays. And Corey Lee, who's taken over the starting catcher job for the White Sox. You're looking at like really deep formats for those two guys. Um, but, you know, if you are in a two catcher league and like a 15 team two catcher league and you lost Wilson Contreras, like those are the type of names you may need to turn to. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned Stevenson because he was somebody I was really in on last year. And that was part of maybe he'll get some DH time when he's not catching. That's out the window now. They have too much good depth for him to maybe play that way. But I've always thought he had an interesting hitting profile and that's an offense we like. It's a park we like. But do but, they? Like that's, I think that's an interesting point is like what you're like, do they have too much depth? The lineup really hasn't been hitting well. Um, Jake Fraley is right now their, their regular DH, but they don't play him against the lefties. Uh, Christian Encarnacion Strand is not hitting. Heimer Candelario is not hitting. Like, if Tyler Stevenson were to get hot, I think DH at bats could be feasible for him, certainly against lefties when they're not going to play Jake Fraley. Perhaps. Um, maybe I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking down the, the rundown and thinking, you know, Friedel's going to come back. And he, yeah, he's, just the yeah, idea he's of one extra hitter in this lineup. But here's the bottom line I've always thought Stevenson was a good hitter. And mm -hmm. I think he ran a little bit unlucky last year with injuries and just some things didn't go his way. I, I still, I think there may be a little bit of post hype interest with with him and you have to when you lose a catcher it just just it's not like other positions where you might pick up somebody you're pretty happy with i mean you, you're just gonna have to accept the hit there isn't a wilson you know unfortunately we've run out of Contreras brothers right there isn't a third right. Contreras brother you can pick up but um I, I guess maybe the pickup of the year for catcher was travis darno when the injury happened to murphy early in the season and i don't know mm -hmm. when murphy's gonna come back but this is just one of those positions where you take a hit and it's like, okay, I'm going to have to try to manage this. And if I can get 30 or 40% of what I thought Contreras was going to be, you, you're probably going to be happy with that. Yeah. You got to, you got to mix and match. Um, you mentioned TJ, TJ Friedel was returning. Uh, he came back immediately slotted back into the leadoff spot and playing center field. I have to expect that's what is going to happen. Um, most people were already holding Friedel or had picked him up in the last couple of weeks when he was nearing a return. I don't think there's really anything actionable here. It seems like, again, we're, we're not dealing with a large sample size in terms of lineups, but it seems like the big, you know, loser here in terms of playing time is Santiago Espinal. He was moving around a little bit and they were DHing, like they were, they were changing who was DHing. It would be India one day, Candelaria one day, you know, et cetera. It seems like, Espinal just moved to the bench. Jake Fraley, Will Benson will kind of DH and play right field. So I don't think there's really anything actionable here with the Reds. Um, the other big return was Cody Bellinger. Um, he returned yesterday into uh, the Cubs lineup. Um, and then uh, Seiya Suzuki is nearing a rehab assignment. So you have... Um, Patrick Wisdom, who was probably who wasn't playing a lot anyway, but was going to lose a little playing time because he was playing some outfield and, and DHing some. Um, but I guess my my question to you is: It seems like Bellinger being back doesn't have a massive impact on the lineup, but Suzuki starting a rehab assignment when he comes back, it's got to be one of 
Mike Taukman or Pete Crow Armstrong who vacates. And Taukman is hitting pretty well. He's a veteran. Um, he has zero options, so he can't be sent down. Mm -hmm. It feels like all signs point to Seiya Suzuki returns and Pete Crow Armstrong goes back down to the minors. Yeah, I mean, one guy offers the offense, one guy offers the defense. I'm not sure that PCA is ever going to be a major league hitter anyway, even though he's such a good defender. So a talk about with no options would seem to make the most sense there. And I'm I'm really excited to see what this Cubs lineup can do when they get everybody at full throttle. Let me just backtrack to the Mets really quickly. You talked about Fraley coming back. I'm sorry, Friedel, Friedel coming back. There's so many underachievers on this offense, which you kind yes. of can't. I mean, and and can understand Strand off to a horrible start. Candelario off to a poor start. Benson and India both have OPS pluses under a hundred. Is there a buy opportunity? Now we, we know obviously Ellie's off to a great start. Steers off to a decent start. Stevenson is is kind of back in form. It's, it's just nice to see that. But is there a buy low here? Is there a guy? We know the Candelaria has the contract. Um, Chris uh, Encarnacion Strong can play a few different positions, which is true of a lot of guys. Uh, Benson's start is disappointing. He still has seven stolen bases. He still has four home runs, but he's hitting under two hundred. I keep waiting for Jonathan India to do something. I, I have a bunch of India shares where when I need to go to the wire just for something fun, not a need pickup, but more like, oh, I, I want to add this. Like when I was looking to add Christian Scott like a week ago, it's like, is Jonathan India my drop? I feel like I'm right. almost ready to drop in Jonathan India three times a week and I never do it. And I hope I don't look back on this season and say all the stuff. I Now, granted, I did get Christian Scott in that league, so I'm happy. But uh, we'll see if I'm happy after he pitches against the Braves. But – I wonder if I'm just being too patient with India. And, and I wonder if this is a league where I have Candelario because the playing time is there. Uh, what's your status on some of these lesser reds who aren't hitting? Because eventually there's going to be a, a roster cut. Somebody's not going to get playing time. And, and you know, maybe, I don't know, does Encar Encarnacion Strain go back to the minors? Uh, what's the state of the reds address right now? It's tough. Um, I, I, I'm keeping the faith in Candelario. Um, he's somebody that I had faith in coming into the year, so I'm trying not to overreact too much. Um, he is, if you, I like using uh, Pitcher List has these rolling hitting charts um, that I that I really like. I mean, I know Statcast has rolling hitting charts too, um, but like they have a Statcast, um, they have a hitting chart called called decision value which looks at like the in zone and out of zone swing decisions and just what are the what how strong are the decisions that a hitter is making mm -hmm. and candelario's decisions have actually gotten better as the year is going on he's 75th percentile in terms of his in zone and out of zone swing decisions um the pitches that he's getting to hit are hittable pitches so it's not like he's you know chasing at pitches in a, at an egregious amount his contact ability um, his contact rate is like just below MLB average. So I'm looking at a lot of things and I'm like, the performance isn't there, but he's not really tanking in a lot of things. Like he's his strike zone judgment, you know, is kind of like around league average. His decisions are kind of around league average. Uh, it's just not happening for him right now. Um, I think he's starting to get like a little bit passive. Um, and then I look at something like uh, Christian Incarnacion Strand, and I look at the same metrics for him, and his decision values all season have been sub 10th percentile in baseball. His strike zone judgment is 11th percentile in baseball. Um, his contact ability is right around league average. So like like I'm looking at this, he's he's over the 90th percentile in swing aggression. So he's being incredibly aggressive. His decisions have not been good. And that kind of goes back to like prior to last year. That's what people said about him in the minors. His strikeout rates are going to be there. He's overly aggressive. He, you know, will chase pitches out of the zone, et cetera. And we're kind of seeing that right now as he struggles. Um I don't know that the Reds have a reason to hit the reset on him and, and bring him to the minors, but also like they just signed Mike Ford today, left-handed hitting first baseman who had a, you know, I'll, I'll look up his stats as we're going through, but had a decent number of home runs for the Mariners last year. Um, and that's a major league deal. Like that's not a minor league deal. Mike, Mike Ford is going to be on this roster. Um, 
that that to me is a concern because that's a guy who only plays first base in DHs. Um, and we just talked about how the DH spot is Jake Fraley right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, Mike Ford could just be a left-handed bench bat, but he's there now. And so there's a left-handed bat that they can play at first base in DH. And to me, that's somebody looking over the shoulder of Christian Encarnacion Strand. Yeah, that sounds like CES is, is probably going to be in the minors at some point. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Sometimes it's, it's go down, mash pitching that you're you're better than, and then we'll get you back up here. But um, it's – he in a medium mixed league, I, you have my permission to cut him. I, maybe a lot of people have already moved on. I'm not sure what his roster tag currently is on Yahoo. But um, when when they're adding Ford, a, a guy that – to a major league deal that's his his playability is a little bit redundant to what ces does i have a feeling that there's another shoot's gonna drop probably in the next couple yeah. of days yeah well, well obviously you guys should check the roto world player news for that as we as we get that news we'll make sure it's up to you as soon as possible um we talked a little bit about steven kwan going on the io last time we didn't know the extent of the injury when we recorded it is a month um he's going to be out for a month with that hamstring injury. Um, and so that's a, a long period of time. I can understand in leagues without an IL spot. Um, if you feel inclined to move on, because what you know, you're getting from Quan is a good batting average um, and, and stolen bases. Uh, the stolen bases may take a little bit of a hit when he's back, depending on, you know, how the hamstring responds. Um, but Quan, who I really, who I do like, I'd be trying to hold him if I could, but I understand that, in some formats without IL spots, you know, ha- holding a guy on your bench for a month, like you want to make sure that that guy is a really impact hitter. And that might not be Steven Kwan, depending on who's on your, your wire. Um, four straight games, Estevan Floriel hitting leadoff, playing left field or right field for the Guardians. Um, he's hitting just 206 on the year with a 37% strikeout rate. So uh, I don't really know if that's anything actionable to it, but that that appears to be the way that the Guardians are going um, with Esteban Floreal in the outfield because Ramon Laureano is doing nothing. Um, and sadly, you know, Chase DeLauder had that foot, you know, that fifth metatarsal injury. It's not like he's coming up. Um, so I would say the name to keep an eye on um, – Again, I'll, I'll tout the work of, of Chris Clegg, who was on our show, our Q&A, uh, two weeks ago. He mentioned Jonathan Rodriguez, who's a 24-year-old outfielder in AAA for the Guardians right now, hitting 280 uh, with a 26% strikeout rate, 15% walk rate, six home runs, and three steals in 32 games at AAA. Um, I, that would be a name to watch if if somebody from the guardians is going to get a call because Floriel and Loriano are, are not doing it right now. You know what I would try to do, Eric, I, I would try to trade for Steven Kwan. He had 28 runs scored in 32 games, parts of that leadoff spot, even number of walks and strikeouts. I mean, he's just almost impossible to strike out and he's not totally punchless. He had three home runs too. He's probably going to end the season with double digit home runs and steals. I think he's one of the most underrated players in baseball. He has, he plays a style that is not, congruous to the way most people play mm-hmm. you know where they strike out a lot they try to hit home runs he's a, a guy who just sent, try slaps the ball puts it in play runs well as an excellent defender as well he's somebody who i don't roster so maybe i'm just projecting some of my own wishes on this but it sounds like you know i'm not an injury optimist but it sounds pretty good that we'll see him back in about a month's time yeah um i'm i'm feeling good about him you, how excited were you we, we saw Manzardo got the call this week. And I know some people are over the moon for him. He hasn't done anything so far through two games, seven at bats. He's made outs all seven times. He's struck out five times. Do you think there's any staying power to him or this is just going to be a cup of coffee and he'll be back before back in the minors before the end of the month? I'd like to believe there's staying power. I mean, he mm-hmm. was hitting well in AAA. He's been an advanced hitting prospect. Um, I don't know that he has anything left to prove in AAA. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw like, you know, Andy Pajas came up for the Dodgers and struck out a lot in the first week and then settled in. Um, we've seen it before. We've seen guys, you know, get that opportunity to kind of adjust to major league pitching. I, I'd like to believe Manzardo could do that. Um, the concern for me is the Guardians aren't going to move Josh Naylor back out into the outfield, even though that would address like multiple of these concerns of like who's playing left field you know can we get manzardo and naylor both in the lineup um like you see manzardo sitting today because they're dh'ing jose ramirez 
and they didn't want to take Naylor out of the lineup, so Manzardo's sitting on Wednesday. Um, that's a, a minor concern going forward, but I just think the lineup lacks a little bit of punch. There's nobody in AAA who's like, oh man, this guy has to be up here other than Manzardo. So I think he's he has a little bit of a, a stretch right now. Um, as we mentioned when he was getting called up, like this isn't, I think he's going to be a solid batting average hitter. I really do. I don't think he's a 30 homer bat, but you know, I think that he, I think that he will adjust, but understanding that he is not a major power guy and isn't going to steal, like you're looking at a three category fantasy contributor who will contribute a decent amount in homers, but maybe less than you would normally get from your first baseman. And so I, I was never bidding like over the moon aggressively, um, really good and on like on base percentage formats and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, and I, I support your idea of acquiring Quan if you're in a state, if you're in an IL league and if you're in a state where you're not like overcome with injuries. Um, you know, I, I have some places where like, you know, I now have Eovaldi on the IL and Bobby Miller on the IL and Casas on the IL and, um, you know, Wilson Contreras just went on the IL. If you're in an NFBC format, like, you know, I know a lot of people are holding on to like Luis Robert. Um, a lot of people are holding on to, again, guys like Brian Wu and Bobby Miller. And I know some of those guys are coming back, but the idea just being there, there is a, there's a possibility that you're in a situation where the, you already have IL designated guys on your bench who are serious difference makers. And there's always a limit to what you can hold on to that. That's why I really like that NFBC format where you just get your seven bench guys and you can decide how much of that you want to devote to injury. And people always say, well, you get, you get to have unlimited IL because it's unfair to the guy who gets injured players. But when you play in leagues that have unlimited IL, what happens is that the waiver wire is skanky. It's like mm -hmm. you have all the storage area in the in the world, and you have difficulty picking up players who are impactful. I think, and, and I know it's not fun to cut a player you don't want to, but when you make managers make difficult decisions in fantasy leagues, I think that actually yep. adds to the skill. I think that's a feature, not a bug. And I know it sounds kind of weird, like, well, wait, why would I want to cut a guy I don't want to cut? That just adds skill to the game and it adds nuance to the game. So to me, um, you know, Yahoo of course has IL spots in their standard format. You can go in and you can still, by the way, form a Yahoo League if you want to. We're still updating the ranks and the game is open. So if you have any FOMO on any of this stuff or your teams aren't doing as well, or you just want to open up another team and win another championship, yeah. go ahead and do it. I always have limited IL spots. We did that friends and family draft about a week ago. I think we have two IL spots. So I'm giving you a couple of outs, but it's not unlimited because to me, when yeah. you have to make these tough choices, I think that actually makes the game more yeah. representative of skill. And keeps the waiver wire, um, you know, yes. populated later on into the year. You get the wire should time. always be interesting. I, I don't like it. You know, I'm in NL Tout, and Tout, Tout Wars is a blast and everything. I'd rather be in the mixed league. I couldn't do it for scheduling reasons this year. It makes me depressed to go on that waiver wire because there's just never anything I want. I, you know, I, I got Reed Garrett a month ago. That was like the highlight, and, and look, he's been really good. So that's, that's a happy ending. But I, I'm... I have to replace Wilson Contreras this week and I'm going to replace him yeah. with, unless I get his replacement. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to be looking at a guy who, who well, bats five times a week. Yeah. That's like I, in AL tout, I had to replace Rene Pinto last week because the Rays sent him down mm -hmm. and I replaced him with Martin Maldonado who like is, is, you know, not good and barely plays, but it's an AL two AL only two catcher league. Mm -hmm. And there was just nobody available. Um, I was able to get Johnny DeLuca in that league. And I will just Nicely say, done. you know, this wasn't on the rundown, but Johnny DeLuca is, has been starting in center field for the Rays since coming off the IL. He plays good enough defense that um, they may, you know, that was why Jose Siri was in the lineup because he could play defense. I think they're giving DeLuca a chance to run with this job. The Rays do like to Ray, as people say, and they platoon, but they've shown that center field and shortstop are positions where they'll say, if you can play defense and you're passable, we'll keep you in the lineup because they value defense at those two spots. And so if DeLuca can be a good enough center fielder, a good center fielder, I, he has a chance to play more often than not. Um, and, you know, he's an interesting player. They they apparently were interested. They wanted him in that 
Tyler Glass now deal. He was mm -hmm. a part of the deal they sought out. Um, and so, again, that's a deeper formats play right now, but it is something to note. Um, speaking of the Dodgers, Bobby Miller um, is set to begin a rehab assignment. Um, nothing really actionable on that, just so you know. He's probably probably was not dropped anywhere, shouldn't have been dropped anywhere, uh, but just know that he is coming back. Um, that Dodgers rotation is going to get a little uh, fuller, and so that could be the end of – we've already kind of seen – you know, Landon Knack and potentially Gavin Stone get bumped out by the return of, of Walker Buehler. And so I think some of those names are going to be um, removed from the starting rotation for a time being. Um, so keep an eye on that. And then obviously the big talking point, um, we mentioned the Dodgers uh, bullpen situation on Monday's podcast. And then we mentioned multiple pitchers. Um, and of course, the first save went to Alex Vesia. Um, who is none of the pitchers that we mentioned. But I think to me, that's a clear indication that the Dodgers are going to mix and match. Um, in that save opportunity, Blake Trinan faced the heart of the order again in the eighth inning. That left the ninth inning for Vesia, who's a left-handed pitcher um, and has you know looked pretty good after um, a little bit of like a rocky start to the year, but has looked pretty good. Um, has a 156 ERA in, in 17 innings so far this year. So I, I think you're going to see a mix of like Hudson, Trinan, Vesia, like the Dodgers are going to mix and match in that. And so if you're in a deep league, like, yeah, I think Vesia is worth a small bid, not because he's the guy, but because I think he is one of the guys. I think you like him a little bit more than I do. He's got the 12 walks. I know two of them were intentional because he's left-handed. A lot of times there's a reason why those guys don't, it's more likely for them to maneuver in and out of situations earlier than the ninth inning. I see no reason why Hudson and, and I know Hudson has said he, he's not really fond of closing, but I see no reason why he and Trining couldn't be the ninth inning guys more often than not. And Vesia's FIP is well over four. So I think that ERA is a little bit of a mirage, but Bottom line is that Dave Roberts is he he has he's dealing from leverage, right? They've already raced out to a nice lead in that division. They're basically, you know, eight toes already in the playoffs. You mentioned how Miller's gonna come back soon. I the Dodgeritis is gonna start soon, right? Where it's gonna you guys are gonna have hiccups and they're gonna be missing starts here and there because this team is playing for October. But I'm sensing a full blown committee until they get Phillips back. Yeah, I will say Vessia has not allowed <laughs> has not allowed a run in his last ten appearances um he's pitching a lot better than he was before mm -hmm. um he also has only two walks in his last eight appearances while striking out um nine in those eight appearances so I, he is getting a little better but i agree with you i think it's more a matter of like if trinan and hudson are used or hudson are used earlier on in high leverage situations and you're facing lefties in the ninth or the seven eight nine hitters um, then it might, you know, that's when I think they would use Vesia, not like to get the primary outs, but that enables him to factor in in this decision again in in deeper formats. If you're if you're really struggling, what did you think of the first Walker Bueller start? Um, I thought it was fine. Like uh, obviously, him hitting uh, 96 on on the gun was good. Um, you know, we were we were talking about his velocity like earlier on in terms of like, you know, oh, he's only 92 in, in his rehab outings. And, you know, that wasn't particularly good. Um, I, he didn't give up a lot of hard contact. Um, so I know that he gave up runs and, you know, but like a 23% ICR, 23% ideal contact rate um, is not bad. Um, and so that to me, that to me was, was nice to see, um, you know, the, like where was his i felt like he was yeah he it was just like the command was a, a little bit of an issue and I, I don't think that that's like anything unexpected like he was he threw pitches in the strike zone 40 percent of the time um that's not great but you know it's his first start after a long layoff so i uh, to me it's like he wasn't getting hit hard the stuff seemed fine getting back to like a little bit of what we were expecting of him before. It's like a everything graded out like a tick down from where he was at, but again, nothing drastic. And it was his first start back. What's, but, what's reasonable. Is he like a top 
40 starter, a top 35 I think top starter, 30. top 50 starter. You think, I think exactly. top, okay. I think top 30 given the given the landscape, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're talking about a landscape that doesn't have Garrett Cole, that doesn't have Spencer Strider, that doesn't mm-hmm. have Bobby Miller, that doesn't have Grayson Rodriguez, that doesn't have Joe Musgrove. Like these are all guys who were top 20, top 25. It, that's because including Joe Musgrove brings it down. But like these are all guys that were top 20 starters coming into the year. They're all out right now some out for an extended period of time mm-hmm. um no Kodai Senga no Max Scherzer like you know when you start eliminating all of those guys Bueller as a top 30 starter feels like maybe Bueller as a top 40 arm if we're talking about a healthy pitching landscape mm-hmm. um and that to me feels like where I'm comfortable putting him at um so yeah that's that's where I'm at I, I think we're in a similar neighborhood. I was thinking top 40, but that's really, that's a, a kind of a nitpicky difference. So yeah. I think we're probably on the same page there. And, and as you mentioned, the velocity was surprisingly hitting a few ticks higher than they expected. And they, they all mentioned that after the yeah, voluntarily too, by the way, it wasn't like, you know, people were pressing them on that, but they, uh, Bueller seemed himself pleased after kind of a mediocre rehab run it was a little bit longer than they expected and granted your know, rehab starts you have to take them with a grain of salt because they're just going out to get their work in to get their throws in mm-hmm. it's not like it's more about the process and the results and, and getting ramped up and, and getting your your stamina back and all that stuff so uh, it seems like are we over the moon for walker bueller right now it's like okay great you know back in like Cy young contention i don't think anybody's thinking that but i'd, I'd just be happy i have a couple of bueller shares and if he could just be set and forget for the moments that he's healthy this year, I would take that. Fully agree on that one. Uh, we're going to get to some of our preseason calls, but before we do that, Nelly Corda looks to continue her dominance with a sixth straight LPGA Tour victory this week in the Cognizant Founders Cup. Find out if she comes through in New Jersey by streaming Peacock Live from Thursday through Sunday. Um, so that kicks off tomorrow. If you want to make sure you watch that, um, I know you were talking about just how good Nelly Corda is. I'm obviously not a golf Fabulous. follower, but I, I trust your opinion. Yeah, we're at a time where there's two dominant players on the two tours. Scotty Scheffler is dominating on the PGA <coughs> Tour. The only thing that stopped him is that his his wife just had a baby or is, was due to have a baby anytime now. So he's not going to play again until the PGA Championship. That's next week. And Nelly Corda is basically just winning every week on the LPGA Tour. And uh, producer Adam and I were talking about it. As somebody who's a regular golfer, you know, I'm, I'm I'm a pretty good golfer, but you know, I my game doesn't translate to anything close to like a college player or a pro player or anything like that. But I do think that the average golfer can see more similarities in their games with the female players because you know, we just I'm never going to hit the ball 330 yards. I don't have the torque of of mm-hmm. Rory McIlroy or your Peak Tiger or anything like that. I, I think the the way that the women play is much more. I don't know, just something to strive for and, you know, the balance and um, you know, the constant uh, low point on the swing and everything. Yeah. But yeah, Nelly Corda is, is worth the price of admission. Just an absolute gorgeous swing and great competitor. And uh, I, man, I hope she wins 10 in a row. I'll be, I'll be watching all weekend, see if she can do it. Um, other high performers and some low performers actually uh, in revisiting our preseason bold predictions. Um, Scott and I are just going to take a, a, swing at a couple of these um some that worked some that didn't uh starting off uh one of my one of the things i said in the preseason was that cj abrams was the best value in the fourth round um so far working out pretty well even though i have very limited shares um and you know that's a that was a roster decision um i wound up getting a lot of starting pitching in the fourth round instead um and that's a little bit unfortunate because CJ Abrams is hitting 275 to start the year with seven home runs, 24 runs scored, 19 RBIs, and eight stolen bases. Um, this is a guy everybody was questioning the power. Uh, not, his b- barrel rate is up 9.4%. He's pulling the ball more. Um, he's you know getting to that pull side power a little bit more often. He's not swinging and missing anymore. Um, and you know, shocking to believe that what we saw from a guy who was just in his age 22 season last year was not his peak. And people were suggesting that it was that he was not, not that good. Um, And I think, you know, a little bit of disrespect for CJ Abrams and he's, he's been a really great performer in fantasy so far this year. 
and the Washington lineup surprisingly has been about league average. And you know, Garcia has been a nice player for them. Kyle Finnegan's just getting a save every other day. It feels like, and it's just so nice to see that team be competitive, be around 500, which is I think a reasonable goal for them the rest of the way. Um, great baseball city. Um, I'm having a lot of, I, I'm hoping that that Lane Thomas can come back and, and be productive. All he was really doing was running. He wasn't hitting at all, but it sounds like he's not that far away. So maybe Ruiz can get going too. He's off to a poor start. He was dinged mm-hmm. up for a while. I'd like to see Mackenzie Gore be a little bit better than he's been so far. But for the most part, Washington is playing above expectation. And a huge part of that is CJ Abrams. I think you certainly deserve a check mark, a hit on that one. I One of my predictions was that Seattle had the best starting rotation in baseball. And it's, yeah, maybe it's not technically right, but man, look at look at the guys you could have drafted, right? Logan Gilbert right now might be the Cy Young Award winner. He's got unbelievable mm-hmm. stats. Miller's been terrific. I know Castillo and Kirby don't have the ERAs we expect, but you know, Kirby's whip is 104. Castillo's is 114. I often say when the ERA and whip don't match up, I trust the whip. They're going to be fine. Kirby, I think Kirby just had that one bad start. Of course, Wu got hurt early in the season. I still blank it. And I realize the Dodgers have, you know, they have like seven or eight great pitchers. You just never know who's healthy at any given point in time. But if I could batch my rotation, say, okay, just give me all the pitchers on this team. Mm -hmm. I still would want, I still would want the Seattle pitchers. Yeah, I I fully agree. I think that, you know, we've seen Luis Castillo get off to slow starts before. So it's certainly not anything that I um, am concerned about. I, I love, you know, all those guys. And then we got Brian Wu, coming back um so i, I fully co-signed that what you said i i want to just really you, you, by the way you know you know how great castillo is when it's like oh disappointing start he's got 56 strikeouts 354 era 1.14 yeah. whip that totally plays right and his sierra is suggesting that uh yeah, the, much the performance yeah. is going to continue to get better um just a note on cj abrams too i just want to say like there's nothing necessarily actionable about it right now but i think it's important when we have this conversation in January about Jackson Holiday and Wyatt Langford and mm-hmm. Christian Encarnacion Strand and maybe Kyle Manzardo is like it just because it doesn't happen for a guy in their first taste doesn't mean it's not going to happen for a guy right we've seen all the time that it's that prospects don't just hit right out of the gate mm-hmm. and also important to understand I know we say hey don't just take second half sample sizes and carry them into the next season That's not a one-size-fits-all thing. A second-half sample size from a young player who made an adjustment and saw real gains is very different than a second-half sample size of a 28-year-old who, like, you know, had a hot streak because he was more he was swinging more aggressively in the zone and was you know hitting more home runs because he was jumping on more first pitch fastballs and and things like that that's very different than when we see it happen with a young player who's adjusting to the to the level because again they have to be tangible changes not just like oh he went on a hot streak but those changes mean more than the changes of an established veteran who you know is you know, maybe just like a, well, who pitchers could adjust back to more easily, things of, of that nature. Um, it's not a perfect science, but I just think we're, people were too quick to write off C.J. Abrams because of two iffy seasons and what everybody looked at was like one hot streak. And what did he do in the final third of the season? Improve confidence, improve production, moves up in the, order. in the lineup. And here's another thing, too. He was such a high percentage base dealer last year. It's one thing when a, when a player hits and you think, well, the pitchers are going to try to figure out why he's hitting and, and how can we adjust to this. When somebody steals bases at a high percentage, what are you going to do? There's no way to stop it. We're, we've never been in a time where they're giving away stolen bases like they are right now. I actually think Abrams could run a little bit more than he is right now, but he's just mm-hmm. one of the best percentage stealers. We, we talk about player development isn't always linear, but – I just thought the way that Abrams ended last season with the confidence growing with the spot in the, it's it's hugely important to change the difference between batting seventh, eighth or ninth and batting first or second for the volume, for the exposure to the better hitters in your lineup is so important. That's why I talk about, I think I mentioned him earlier, you know, Zach Neto didn't hit at all for two weeks. And and not that Zach Neto necessarily is going to be CJ Abrams in a year, but I really think there's going to be a time this season. It's probably not that far away. The Angels have a million guys hurt. 
And I joked on Twitter last night that they're not happy until they put out like five guys in their lineup that you didn't even know were in baseball anymore. That's where the Angels are at right now. Yeah. Eventually, Ron Washington is going to hit Zach Neto first or second. He's already said, run as much as you want. That's pretty much the edict on that entire Angels team. I, I can see the Zach Neto trajectory maybe being a year behind the C.J. Abrams trajectory. Yeah, Zach Neto was actually one of our predictions on here. You and I both had him as going 2020 um, on the year. Kind of and on pace for that. He's not well, far away from that. So far, he's got three homers and five steals. The steals, and with the way the Angels are running, 20 steals feels entirely reasonable for Zach Neto. Um, if he starts hitting a little more, um, I think the 20 home runs is, is we're looking more at like a 15, 20 pace, but again, we're not way off here. His barrel rate is pretty much in line with last year. He's pulling the ball less and he's hitting far more ground balls, which are obviously going to lead to, um, fewer home runs. I think a lot of that has to do with him swinging, um, outside of the zone a little more than last year. And so he's swinging and missing a little more and not really getting pitches he could drive. Um, but again, young player making adjustments. I still think that there's an interesting bat in here and he mm -hmm. goes on some stretches where he looks pretty good. And so you know, I'm not ready to, weeks. his OPS is over a thousand the last two weeks. I'm not, yeah, I'm not ready to say that we're, we're not going to hit this 2020 call. I think it, I think it could happen. He's 14% rostered in Yahoo right now. I, I, I could easily see that being like 50% when we hit June. Yeah. Um, we got a couple tigers predictions. I said that the tigers will have five pitchers, that are startable in 12 team leagues. And so that meant I, I, you know, said if you have like a 12 team league and you have, you know, six starting pitcher spots, you know, you're looking at like around 72, I believe it was my quick math, like starters. So like you're looking at five Tigers pitchers who are in the top 60, sorry, top 70 based on like player Raiders. Um, and I specifically mentioned on there that I'm including Matt Manning in that because I felt like he didn't make the rotation but there's real upside there and he might get a shot uh, in the year. And so that makes me um, a little bit more confident that we might hit on this because Tarek Skubal, Jack Flaherty, mm -hmm. Reese Olsen, and Casey Mize have all been flirting around that, that top 70 mark. They've all looked pretty good to start the year. Um, Olsen, Flaherty, and Skubal um, have been, been really good. Flaherty has been pretty much elite, um, over the last, you know, four or five starts, as you have pointed out, Casey Mize, you know, with a 398 ERA, um, and just a, um, 17% strikeout rate has not really kind of flourished in there, but I, I like a lot of what we're seeing from him. And I don't know if it's going to happen this year or next year. Again, he's, you know, really, he's just coming off a total lost season. So I don't know when it's going to click, but I like what he's doing. The weak link has been Kenta Maeda. Um, and I think that might be the link that Matt Manning fills at some point in time. But I feel like this, I feel pretty good about Scooble, Olsen, and Flaherty. I feel like Mize is on the fringes. And I really do think like Manning has made two starts this year and looked pretty solid in them. And I think if he gets a shot, I think we could hit on this uh, five Tigers in the top 70. I think you made a great prediction. Um, maybe made is done, but everybody else is going to meet or beat their ADP. Flaherty, it's comical. He doesn't have any wins, but he, and, and by the way, that ERA is so not real. There's like been a couple of starts where he's just been let down by his defense and there's plays that in a different era would have been called errors. They don't call anything an error now unless you saw the ball in half and mail it to Iowa. I mean, it's just so hard to get an error called on you and you see the pitch. And Flaherty has actually been demonstrably frustrated a couple of times by the Tigers' defense. I, yeah. I don't blame him for that, but he looks fantastic. And you know what I'm, I'm really kind of sick of is there's been some mainstream media. That look, we love Tariq Skubal. We loved him before the season. We loved how well he was, how, how dominant he was, I should say, at the end of last year. And I'm seeing all these like, oh, the best pitcher you've never heard of is Tariq Skubal. Stop it. We've, we've heard of Tariq Skubal. We've heard he was of going him. in the third round of our fantasy drafts. <laughs> we've heard of him. But uh, yeah, a 190 ERA, 0.77 yeah. whip. It's a fun um, team. It's a, it's a fun team. I don't I, know. I wish the lineup was hitting a little bit more. I'll get to Riley Green well, in a second. Yeah, I, I, also, I also think that there could be as much as – Full Jason Foley's been really good to me, and that he's somebody I was very proactive towards. He hasn't pitched that well lately. Ugly blown save in mm -hmm. New York. He's not missing as many bats. He has a walk problem. I know Lang has good 
ratio right now. He's walking a lot of guys too. They have Shelby Miller. I think AJ Hinch is a good manager. I don't think he's going to wait around. They still think they can make the, the playoffs this year. Right. So be careful. If you have Foley, I'd be ready to have some kind of insurance. I know it's no fun to buy insurance, but I think you might need to be ready to see who gets the next Detroit save, although it could even be a full blown committee. I was all in on Riley Green before the year. And the, the thing that's nice about Green, he has the home runs. But the rest of his profile, I still think is is maybe under kicking what he could be. Mm-hmm. I think at peak, he's going to be like a 285, 25, 15 type of player. He's Sometimes he hits leadoff. Sometimes he hits third. At least they're playing him against all pitching. I know they do a lot of platooning. It's kind of ruined Kerry Carpenter, who's a fantasy-relevant player. But with Green, who was a high pick out of high school, I think a top five selection, they know he has superstar quality, and it's just better off to let him face lefties, let him learn against them, let him develop. They're not jerking him around. And right now I'd say he's maybe slightly baiting his ADP, but I think he still has a chance to go down as a – when we look at like who were the 15 or 20 right answers, I still think Riley Green has a good chance of being in that list by the end of the season. Fully agree. I was in on him and didn't get enough shares. Um, couldn't just couldn't pull the trigger when it came time. I was also in in the same range on guys like, you know, Ian Happ and I think um, and Taylor Ward. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I went in different directions um, in the drafts and some some hit. I'm not I'm obviously not upset about Taylor Ward shares, but I, I wish I had more Riley Green. Um, I drafted a lot of Shota Imanaga, and I feel really good about that. Um, mm-hmm. On the bold predictions. Episode, I said that Shota Imanaga would have a better fantasy season than Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Um, I will admit I didn't believe it. It was a bold prediction show, and so I was trying to get bold, and it was my way of just highlighting that I thought Imanaga was being undervalued. Um, And obviously, there's not really much you can say about what he's done so far in his, you know, in his first uh, seven starts uh, with a 108 ERA. Um, he's got 43 strikeouts to just five walks. He looks really good. Um, I don't think it's a fluke. Obviously the one zero three ERA is a fluke. Like this, his this ERA is going to go up. Um, but I, I, he's earned everything. Don't try to sell high or, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Like he's, he is legitimately a very good pitcher and his contract was outright robbery. That's a great call. And, and I, I have a few Imanaga shares that I can directly attribute to just sharing this podcast with you and you making such cogent points. I'm like, yeah, I, I think Eric's right. And he's so watchable, right? He's around the plate. He's got that rising fastball. He's got that splitter. Uh, there's a nice gap, velocity gap. And the fact that he can be here, – here's another thing, too. You, you know a pitcher's good when he can survive in the zone without – a miles per hour number mm-hmm. that's crazy, right? The fact that he can be successful throwing 92, 93, 94 in a world where there's so many fire breathing dragons that that just outlines knowing how to pitch. And it's a really fun Cubs team. I'm thrilled that they got Bellinger back last night. He had a home run in that night game. Unfortunately, Imanaga didn't get a win in that game, even though he pitched very well, but he's become must, must see TV. Glad to have a bunch of roster shares of him. I did give out Cutter Crawford, bold prediction, top 40 starter. That was, you know, to steer into the boldness. I, you know, if you really made me put my feet to the fire, I'd be like, well, I hope he's top 60. I hope he's rosterable all year. Of course, now I'm over the moon for Cutter Crawford. He's got a little bit of that Jack Flaherty going where it seems like he pitches well every game and, and he's getting a little bit unlucky with the bullpen, with the run support. Heck, he just had a quality start against the Braves. I mean, who else do you need to see him do it against before you believe that this guy is real. Andrew Bailey's done some really nice work with this Boston rotation. I know not everybody is healthy right now, mm-hmm. but the Cutter Crawford, all the breakout stuff was there last year. It was just one of those things that was screened. It was, he wasn't always the highest rated prospect. Um, Boston has become one of the lesser teams in that division where nobody thinks they're going to win the division or make the playoffs this year. That They're kind of just in the middle of, I still think stop with this AL central stuff. The AL East is easily the best division in baseball. It's not even, it's cute that the AL central is over producing right now, although they all get to play the white Sox and beat up on them. So that certainly helps, but the AL East, there's no bad teams there. Everybody is potentially a playoff team and nobody's going to bottom out. So it's, it's a really tough division, but uh, yeah, Cutter Crawford has become a CTV for me, and I believe he's going to be – he's not just going to be somebody you start all year. I mean, he could be, like, on a contending fantasy team. He mm-hmm. might be your second or third best starter. Yeah, he's been he's been great. Um, I'm certainly a believer. Uh, not all of our calls from the preseason went well. Uh, I said that Glaber Torres would finish as a top three second baseman. 
uh, behind. It was behind Ozzy Albies and Marcus Simeon was my call. Uh, Glaber has not been good to start the year. Uh, he's hitting 216. He has just one home run, 16 runs scored, three RBIs, career high uh, strikeout rate, um, career high, or not career high, but uh, uh, actually the swinging strike rate is is not really all that bad and he's not chasing out of the zone the zone contact is the lowest he's had since 2020 and again that's a covid shortened season so his zone contact and his overall contact rates right now are like the lowest he's had in a full season of baseball ever um if you look at like pitcher list rolling graphs i talked about they have a pitch hit ability chart which shows like how hittable are the pitches a player is getting like how much of they being pitched in the strike zone and Glaber Torres' pitch hit ability is like really high, which is sad because it means he's getting hittable pitches and he's just not hitting. Like it's not like he's making bad swing decisions. He's just not hitting. Um, I'd like to believe there's going to be some sort of bounce back here. Like I, I just don't believe he's this poor of a player. I don't have anything to point to, to say, Hey, this stat tells me it's going to happen. It's just, I don't think he's this bad. But I think, obviously, expecting him to finish top three among second basemen is going to be nearly impossible with this start to the year. Yeah, one call I got wrong. In, in redraft leagues, I'm not – I generally don't go after the pro, the top prospects aggressively. I expect somebody – like last year, I expected somebody to want Jordan Walker more than I did. And I got a couple of Jackson Holiday shares thinking, look, he's going to go down the AAA. He's going to mash. He's going to come up. And that all happened. And then he came up and just basically struck out for two straight weeks. And not only did I have to deal with that and, and take, you know, have all the excitement. And we had a podcast basically all about Jackson holiday. Oh, he's going to be a great player. He's 20 years old, mm -hmm. but I miss hiding in plain sight. I miss somebody like Jordan Westberg. I was able to make a trade in a league where yep. I have a ton of closers. I was able to trade. I, th I think I traded Finnegan for Jackson hall for, um, for Westberg. It was offered to me. And whenever anybody offers me a fair trade, I, I'm just so over the moon. I almost always say yes, just to say thank you, because I'm, I'm so used to being lowballed or people to act like, you know, I don't know at all what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll just make some dumb. I'll trade you know, my best player for three guys. Somebody just picked up off the waiver wire who are all kind of fringy. But I wish Jackson Holiday is going to be great someday. I'm usually wired to baseball's hard. The guy's just 20 years old. Let's let's be realistic. You know, Baltimore was batting him ninth. Even if he produced right away, there's going to be a little bit of a volume problem there. And I feel like there were screaming opportunities in this great lineup that I missed out on. But Jackson Holiday was the guy I kind of elbowed people out of the way for in a couple of leagues. And I certainly get to take the L on that right now. Yeah. Um, there are some other guys, you know, just to wrap this se segment up really quickly. Um Another, I guess he's rookie eligible, uh, player that I was in on. DL Hall was my most rostered mm -hmm. player. Yep. Um, I thought that he was going to go to the Brewers and get a chance to start, and I really liked the arsenal, and I liked the fact that he was going to have a long leash, and I felt like it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I still do think it will happen. I still like the player. Um, maybe it'll happen like in August this year. Maybe it'll happen next year. Who knows? But he's not on a lot of my rosters anymore. It's just unable to hold on to him. I also had a lot of shares of Parker Meadows and Zach Neto. We talked about Zach Meto, Zach Neto earlier. Parker Meadows was just demoted to AAA. They claim it's just because they're going to face a lot of lefties in the next two weeks, and so they want him playing every day in AAA. I think that's a very nice thing to say publicly about a player who is struggling um, and is not worth putting in your MLB lineup right now. Um, and so unfortunate that I, I missed that call on, on Parker Meadows. Um the other players that I rostered that I'm happy about, um, I had Jared Jones and Mason Miller were my two most rostered pitchers other than Imanaga and D.L. Hall. Those calls have worked out really well. Wow. Uh, Wilson three, Contreras. Three, was, three, gig three gigantic hits in there. Jones, yeah. Miller, and Imanaga. I mean, you, your overall fan fantasy resume must be pretty good just on those three guys it's, alone. I'm having a decent season so far. Uh, I'm, I have one um, O.C., in the NFBC where I'm like fully out of it. I mean, I'm still going to grind through it, but my pitching staff had Joe Musgrove, mm -hmm. Bailey Ober, um, Luis Castillo, who we talked about struggled early on in the year. And there's one other pitcher. I can't remember off the top of my head, but my, my ratios, my pitching categories are just totally sunk in the bottom um, on that team. And like, we'll try and claw back, but it doesn't look likely. Mm -hmm. um, Wilson Contreras is my most rostered catcher. We talked about how that was going really well. And now 
is not uh, have a lot of decisions to make in NFBC formats. And then I had a lot of shares of Jamison Tyone. Uh, that's bumped up by like, you know, draft and hold leagues where, you know, I drafted him and it didn't matter that he was hurt early. And then I picked him up in a lot of places when he was coming back. He's looked pretty good to start, um, you know, his his return. And I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. But who are some of the guys you rostered the most this year? Yeah, one of my big themes was I was looking for control master pitchers who could get strikeouts on volume. It's been a little bit of a mixed bag. Kirby, just an eyelash of a disappointment. I still would buy Logan Webb tomorrow. He's been just an eyelash of a disappointment. One of those starts was against the Dodgers. Uh, Chris Bassett has been outright bad. And at his age, you have to be worried that that maybe he's in a bad part of his career. But Kirby and Logan Webb are going to be fine. I don't regret rostering those guys. I just Their returns have been a little bit less than I expected. I was snap calling Marcus Simeon in the third round. Uh, he, not the greatest average right now, but he's, he's hitting home runs. He's producing runs. I, I'm just always going to be a Marcus Simeon guy. That's worked out. Green's worked out. A lot of Trey Turner in the first round. I felt fine about that until the hamstring injury. We'll see what happens. And sometimes you can be right and wrong at the same time. I did not trust Jose Leclerc. Mm -hmm. And I thought Texas would be proactive about changing their closer really quickly. Leclerc was terrible on opening day and they were proactive. Unfortunately, my David Robertson shares, and he's been great. His stats are really good. He occasionally gets a win. He occasionally gets a save. But Kirby Yates has been the closer there. I did get a little bit of Yates, but I would have really benefited. I had Robertson rostered before the season. So have, have that come to fruition that Robertson stepped into that role, I'd be feeling great right now. Instead, I feel like I had the right diagnosis. I, I just right. had the wrong cure. The wrong the wrong medicine for it. Um we're going to wrap up real quick with just a, a look at the teams that are struggling the most and we want to attack. Uh, but before we do that, the road to the Indianapolis 500 later this month continues this Saturday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time with the Indy Grand Prix on NBC and Peacock. Find out who takes the checkered flag at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway road course. That's this Saturday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on NBC and Peacock. Um, real quick breaking news, uh, two pitchers headed to the IL. Edward Cabrera, um, who left his start yesterday, is going to the IL with a right shoulder impingement. It's the second time on the IL in three months for him. Um, not looking really good there. And then Dane Dunning is going to the IL um, for the Rangers with a shoulder injury. And that's interesting because even though Nathan Eovaldi is expected to um, spend the minimum amount of time on the IL. So Eovaldi should be back in about a week. The other starter is Jose Urania, which means that if Jack Leiter looks good today in one of the starts of the double header, um, there is, there is an opportunity for Jack Leiter to remain in the rotation, um, with Dane Dunning on the shelf, at least until, you know, we start to talk about like Scherzer's coming back and, DeGrom is coming back and Tyler Maui is coming back, but th that's a way down the road. So just something to keep in mind, uh, you know, pay extra special attention to how lighter looks today because there there's a little more runway than we necessarily thought. Um, we're going to end this as a quick hitter, Scott. I'm going to tell you some of the offenses that are really struggling right now and some of the offenses that are are really doing well. And I want you to tell me if you just believe this overall, like, yes, you think these offenses are, you know, struggling and we should use our pitchers to kind of attack them or no you think maybe it's a slow start and so you're not you know really kind of worried about this right now um if you sort teams and you sort by uh strikeout rate right we did them with for pitchers we want to attack teams with the with that strike out a lot it's the seattle mariners they lead baseball with a 28.2 percent strikeout rate uh they're hitting just 222 as a team they are 17th in baseball with a 98 weighted runs created plus. Um, I started Simeon Woods Richardson against them early in the week, and it worked out. Like I feel like you can attack the Mariners right now. Yes, and of course, the most advantageous pitcher park in the American League, which that's, that's what you always see with the pitcher parks, that the strikeout rates go up because pitchers aren't afraid to pound the zone. Because like what they hit, it, so what? It's not going out of the yard. And there's a lot of dead spots in this lineup. J.P. Crawford was, wasn't was hitting at all, and then he hit the IL. Uh, Hanniger got off to a good start. He's been in a slump since then. Julio Rodriguez will eventually turn it around, but it it hasn't happened yet. Yes, I will aggressively – and I love the call. I mean, you, you started a real fringy guy against the Mariners, but they mm -hmm. are get anybody you can against Seattle until further notice. 
Yeah. Two offenses that aren't striking out a lot, but also aren't hitting well or hitting for a lot of power are the Pirates and Cardinals. Uh, they both are striking out under 24% of the time, so you might not get tons of strikeouts there, but uh, batting averages are poor. Slugging percentages are are under 336. ISOs are under 117. Um, are the Pirates and Cardinals offenses that you're looking to target against? Yeah, the, the, the Pirates for sure. Were, I was there before the season, um, but the Cardinals, man, get get the name brand washed out. I mean, Contreras is hurt. They've already sent down Walker. You know, Newt Bar came back, but he hasn't hit at all. Goldschmidt's off to a poor start. Uh, Brendan Donovan's hitting leadoff, but it's kind of a punch. Like he has good um, batting eye, but he's not really hitting for any power. You know, Mason Wynn doesn't even bat last on this team. He's not hitting at all. There are so many dead spots in this lineup. They're the worst team in this division. And I, I think people are really slow to it because the Cardinals for years, it was the voodoo. They'll find yeah. guys out of nowhere. Well, you know what the Cardinals story has become? How do we miss on Randy Rosarena? I know he's off to a horrible start, but how do we miss on Adelise Garcia? They, they've been getting a lot of stuff wrong lately. And this is an old team all of a sudden. Even the defense that we can usually hang our hat on has really come down in the last two years. This team's going to win 70 games. Boom. Uh, last offense to target based on strikeout rate. The third highest strikeout rate in baseball is the Cincinnati Reds. Mm -hmm. uh, almost a 27% strikeout rate. Their team batting average is just 207. That is the lowest team batting average in baseball. Yes, lower than the Chicago White Sox. Uh, their 80 weighted runs created plus is the fourth lowest in baseball. That's the White Sox, Rockies, Marlins, and Reds. I know we were talking about this vaunted Reds offense. Is this Reds offense a team that we can target right now? I mean, other than – I think Steer has been a par. Ellie's been great, although he still is – Ellie's always going to strike out a lot. But who else in this offense is hitting right now? Who else can you feel good about? Yes, um, you, you're going to have to live with – if you stream against the Reds, there's going to be some days where they hit three or four home runs. Especially in Cincinnati. Especially in Cincinnati. But if you stream against the Reds, there's also going to be days where you get 9, 10, or 11 strikeouts. That's going to be in play. These guys come out swinging from their heels. They're not th – th this – I feel like even when you have a quote-unquote bad start against the Reds, you're still going to get seven strikeouts out of it. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with that as well. I'm, I'm changing the way I'm looking at the mm -hmm. Reds. Um, three offenses that – I think are surprisingly good. And so I wanted to point them out here. The first is, is the Red Sox. And so the Red Sox are striking out um, 26% of the time. It's the fourth highest strikeout rate um, in baseball. However, the Red Sox have the seventh highest slugging percentage in baseball. They have the fifth highest ISO in baseball. Um, and so they're, they do have a little bit of punch in the lineup, even though they will strike out. So it's not a, a total avoid. And then both the, the Padres are third in baseball in weighted runs created. Plus they're striking mm -hmm. out just 19% of the time. And the guardians are 10th in baseball in weighted runs created. Plus they're seventh in baseball and run scored. They're seventh in baseball and steals. They're slugging almost 400 um, as a team. The guardians are, which is just outside of the top 10. Um, Red Sox, Padres, Guardians, are you actively avoiding any of these offenses or are you just acknowledging that like you just have to trust the pitcher if you're going against them? Yeah, I think it's more of that um, with the Red Sox and, and the Guardians. I might be actually avoiding the Padres on what a nice move they made to get a rise who fits their offense and maybe Machado's more healthy now. I'm just happy to see the Red Sox have a legitimate lineup. I mean, their mm -hmm. first four, Duran, Devers, O'Neal, who's been terrific, Abreu, they finally got Von Grissom back, who we think is a good player. Connor Wong, maybe a little bit over his skis. I know a lot of people looking for him to replace Contreras. It's just not, and they've had a little bit of bad luck with injuries. Uh, Rafael, I still think he's going to hit. He's been productive the last couple of weeks. He will play because he's already been paid. Um, all I wanted from the Red Sox this year is to, to be a 500 plus team. I think they're going to be that. It's probably on the strength of their pitching, but I think their offense is an underreported story. So, mm -hmm. You're still, I'm still okay. You want to pitch against somebody against Boston and against Cleveland, certainly while Quan is out, I'm okay with it, but I'm not willy nilly streaming guys against those, against yeah. those teams. I do think the Padres are good enough that I'd actually proactively be moving the borderline calls. I'm going to say, no, I'm sitting them against San Diego. I will say also a team that was in the top 10 that I didn't um, mention is the Brewers. Uh, mm -hmm. They're in the top 10 in a lot of categories. They did get Christian Yelich back today, Wednesday. 
that I think is super important that now makes them again an offense not that you're avoiding, but that you're considering, okay, how much do I trust this player? Because they have produced really well with Jelic in the lineup this year. And so now that he's back, I don't think, again, I don't think they're in a void, but I think it's like, a, I'm not running those fringy streamers. I'm not running those streamers against the Brewers um, in the way that I might some of those teams you mentioned. They're a hard team for me to gauge. Of all the surprising teams, I don't know what to do with these guys. I, mm -hmm. I we know everything changed with them. They traded the race. They they lost their manager. They lost their team architect. It seemed like a rebuilding year, and they just hit a, a lot of guys. I don't know how good Bryce Terang is. He I, he can't be as good as he's looked so far. But I mean, being, he, he's a gets on base. He plays a good defense. He obviously wants to run. Willem Contreras, even before Wilson Contreras got hurt, was making the case that he's actually the the better Contreras player. Yelich, I think people have misunderstood. Yeah, he's not Christian Yelich MVP anymore, but he's still a good player. Willie Adamas is having a good season. I thought they bought low on Reese Hoskins. Is this an 88 win team? Is that in play for this? I wish the rotation was deeper because I feel like after Freddie Peralta, I have no idea who any of these guys, if I can count on them week to week. Uh, the bullpen has been okay. McGill right now seems to be solidifying the closer role. Maybe they get Williams back in the middle of the year. I don't know how realistic that is. I'd love to see it. I have a couple of shares in some keeper leagues, but I thought Milwaukee had 78 wins written all over them. And I think I have to reevaluate that now. Yeah. I still think, you know, as we've talked about, it's the Cubs division, uh, but you know, for sure that Milwaukee is certainly being feisty. Um, we'll see how the rest of the weekend plays out. As always, Scott and I will be back on Monday um, to cover the weekend, you know, the weekend winners, the the waiver wires, the guys who've been on a real hot stretch. And then interestingly, next week, May 13th, StatCast is finally unveiling a lot of their bat speed metrics that they've been building up. Um, bat speed has really correlated well to power in a lot of tests, like hitters who have fast bat speed tend to lead to more power, more barrels, etc. So that data is going to become public on the 13th. Um, after that data becomes public, Scott and I are going to look um, on our Wednesday podcast on like who stands out here? Who are some guys that we should really kind of take note of that? So that is coming down the pike tomorrow on NBC sports. I have a pitchers to trade for article looking at pitchers who are kind of underperforming their Sierra. Hey, Jack Flaherty's on that. Um, so make sure you check out that article, which will be live on NBC sports Thursday morning. You can follow Scott and I on Twitter. I am at Samsky NYC. Scott is at Scott underscore. Pianowski, please make sure to rate and review this podcast again. It really helps us out a lot. And we will check you next week for more of the Roto World Baseball Show. Pick up Zach Nato.